Welcome to our church service for Sunday the 28th of June. We're just two weeks away now from resuming a small church service back at the building. Of course that's still subject to government restrictions easing as they plan to ease and so that's subject to change and yet we're pretty excited that we can do that. It's not for everyone. Some of you are very happy just staying at home for now, but especially for those who have been on their own or struggled with technology, we think this will be a real blessing to help people like you. We said that our first priority would be our older members, and we've been in touch with everyone, I think, who's 60 and over in our congregation. We're probably going to have a few spots spare beyond that, and there's also going to be some people who are away from time to time, um, which means that we'll have a few extra spots. Now we're extending that invitation to everyone, as an individual, as a couple, as a family. If you'd like to join us uh, at the church building for our live church service from Sunday the 12th of July, whether that's going to be every week or every second week or third week, depending on how many people would like to do that, can you please let me know? This is your invitation. If you'd like to join us at the building, then please let me know so that we can factor you into our planning because we are limited to 38 people at this stage, of course, subject to change. We will be continuing our online service, though, um, for the foreseeable future until we're all able to meet together once again. And with that in mind, I want to take our call to worship this morning from the book of Hebrews. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, the writer says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. And it's true that, well, none of us are meeting together right now on a Sunday in the person, in the flesh. And yet, as we tune in each Sunday at the same time, we are still meeting together. We're using the blessing of technology at this time to uh, do what we can't otherwise do. We can encourage one another. But I do want to encourage you to, to continue to meet together with others from our church family, to share worship together with them, as many of you have been doing. Because it's also very important that we value and take advantages of the things that community only gives us when we are face to face. But for now, let us encourage one another. Let's be encouraged by God's word together this morning. Let's be encouraged as we sing to him, as we pray to God, as we reflect on his word, as we dedicate this time as special time set apart for the worship of God. Would you join me in a prayer of preparation? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you that we can worship you together this morning. We are scattered throughout our city, throughout our country, and even overseas. And we give you thanks for your good gifts that have meant that we've been able to continue to worship together over these past three to four months. And we do long for the day when we'll be able to gather as a complete family of God, as a complete church community. And yet in the meantime, thank you that we can encourage one another and not give up on the importance of meeting together and, and that we might spur one another on towards love and good deeds. We pray that we might do that this morning in our worship, that you would give us strength for that task, that we might honour you in all that we do and say. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Congregation, we normally begin our services by acknowledging that our help is in the name of the Lord, who made the heavens and the earth. Grace and peace be with you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And acknowledging that we are in God's presence, even as we are in our homes and the homes of our friends, we're going to sing as our opening song this morning, God himself is with us. Why don't you reflect on that? It's very easy sometimes when we're sitting in our homes just to think that it's just us, just our family, just one or two people that we might have invited to join us. God has joined us. God is with us. Reflect on that as you join me in song together. Him. 
with deepest reverence. In our own do we own as a God and Savior. Praise His name This morning we're going to combine our Ministry of Reconciliation and our children's talk together. So listen up kids, we're going to be talking about uh, some of the Ten Commandments today. And I wonder if you know the Ten Commandments. You probably know at least some of them. The first commandment is, you shall have no other gods besides the Lord our God. And the second commandment is quite like it. We shouldn't make any images or idols, and we shouldn't bow down and worship them. I wonder, do you have any idols in your home? We do. In fact, I've put a video of it right up next to me here on the screen. Can you see what it is? That's right, it's our fireplace. And we often like we often find on a cold morning, like the mornings have been this week, that our children come up and they gather around the fireplace. And we often say they come and they become fire worshippers. They bow down and worship the fire. And because you need to feed the fire, don't you? What do you feed the fire? You feed it with wood, don't you? Sometimes we say that all fire worshippers should have to go and get some offerings to the fire god. Now, of course, we're just joking. But an idol is anything that takes the place of God. Anything that's more important than God. And so the fire isn't an idol, not by itself. But if we worship the fire by gathering around the fire instead of doing the things that God calls us to do, if instead of gathering, whether at church or here on the internet as we have a service together, if instead of doing that, we just sat around the fire all day, then the fire would be taking the place of God in a way. Wonder what some of the things are in your life that you might think of as idols. You probably wouldn't call them an idol. They're just things that become more important to you than God. More important than listening to God. Maybe there are things that you'd rather do rather than read the Bible or pray. Maybe there are things that stop you from loving other people. You just get so wrapped up and absorbed in your computer game or your book or your bike or whatever that thing might be that you forget that God calls us to love him with all our hearts and to love those around us the way we love ourselves. There are many things in our lives that can become idols, which is why God tells us here in these first two commandments, don't have any other gods, don't bow down and worship them. Let's pray to God and ask for his forgiveness for the times that we have done that. Let's pray. 
our Father in heaven. We pray for your forgiveness today for the things that are in our lives that we have made more important than you. They've helped us to forget you or to forget the people around us, the people in our families. And so we've turned away from worshipping you with all our heart and maybe we've just worshipped you with some of our hearts instead. Help us to fix our lives in the right direction with you at the very centre. We pray that you'll forgive us for that, for the times when we haven't done that well through Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. When we pray to God, kids, and ask God to forgive us, do you think God does? I think he does, and I know he does, because he gives us these promises. Many of you will have learnt, maybe at school, John chapter 3 and verse 16, which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, not die because of our sins that are unforgiven, but have eternal life. That's really a promise of forgiveness, a promise of new life in Jesus that comes to everyone whose sins have been forgiven. And so if you're trusting in Jesus, you can know that God forgives your sins. I'm going to sing a song together as a whole church family now. It's a song uh, we haven't sung for a while. It's only a holy God. That reminds us that God is a perfect God. He is someone that we we tremble before a little bit. He's, He's a little bit scary because we can't tame him. And he's so much more powerful than we are. And yet we're not fully shaking in our boots afraid because... God loves us. That's the good news that God reveals to us in the Bible. We're going to sing of our holy God and how he sent Jesus to die for all our sins. Will you join me as we sing together? commands all the hosts of heaven, who else could make every king bow down, who else can whisper and darkness tremble, only a holy God. What other beauty demands such praises? What Splendor outshines the sun. What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing. 
This morning we're going to start a short series in the book of Haggai. There's a couple of reasons why we're going to be doing that. Uh, firstly, I just wanted a little bit more time uh, before we move to some of the more difficult passages in 1 Corinthians. And so taking a short series in Haggai will give me a bit more time to do some reading and think more carefully about some of the difficult passages that we've got coming up. But the book of Haggai, I think, also has a message for us as a church. It's a message, as we're going to see today, about building the church and what that looks like today. The book of Haggai finds us in a time where God's people had returned from exile. God's people had turned away from the living God. They had decided not to listen to him any longer. They ignored his warnings through the prophets. And so God brought the Babylonian Empire to send them into exile. In our first reading this morning, which Jonathan's going to take for us, we're going to be reading some of the history of that from the end of Second Chronicles, reading directly into the book of Ezra, the very next book in the Bible. The readings do follow on from one another, so Jonathan's going to just continue the reading from one to the other. Let's pay attention and listen to the word of God. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers again and again, because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of God was aroused against his people, and there was no remedy. He brought up against them the king of the Babylonians, who killed their young men with the sword in the sanctuary, and did not spare the young men or young women, the elderly or the infirm. God gave them all into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. He carried to Babylon all the articles from the temple of the Lord, both large and small, and the treasures of the Lord's temple and the treasures of the king and his officials. They set fire to God's temple and broke down the wall of Jerusalem. They burned all the palaces and destroyed everything of value there. He carried into exile to Babylon the remnant, who escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and his successors, until the kingdom of Persia came to power. The land enjoyed its Sabbath rests. All the time of its desolation it rested, until the seventy years were completed in fulfilment of the word of the Lord, spoken by Jeremiah. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm, and also to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up, and may the Lord their God be with them. And in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and Levites, everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. All their neighbours assisted them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with valuable gifts in addition to all the free will offerings. Moreover, King Cyrus brought out the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the temple of his God. Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought by Mithridath, the treasurer, who counted them out to Sheshbazar, 
the prince of Judah. This was the inventory. 30 gold dishes, 1,000 silver dishes, 29 silver pans, 30 gold bowls, 410 matching silver bowls, and 1,000 other articles. In all, there were 5,400 articles of gold and silver. Sheshbazar brought all these along with the exiles when they came up from Babylon to Jerusalem. As God's people have always done, we bring our offerings to the Lord in recognition of his lordship over our lives and in gratitude for all that he has done for us. While we don't do that in person right now, we do so electronically and also by check, you can find out how you can contribute to the work of the church uh, at our church website. May God bless you as you give. Will you join me now as we come to God in prayer? Our Father in heaven, our good and gracious God, we thank you that we can have just read about how you brought your people back from exile. And Jerusalem fell according to your word, and your people returned from exile also according to your word. You moved the heart of the emperor of Persia to rebuild your temple, and that gives us confidence that you are able to do all things. For if you are sovereign over the heart of the leader of a global superpower like Persia back in its day, then you are certainly able to accomplish your purposes today in our world. And that gives us confidence, confidence to pray. It gives us confidence to pray, Lord, even when we don't understand or don't know your plans and purposes. We don't know why we're in the midst of a global pandemic. We don't know how you're using this time to accomplish your will. But we trust you. Maybe you're shaking us out of our complacency. Maybe you're causing us to depend upon you more fully. Maybe you are drawing the loss to yourself. Whatever your purpose is, Lord, we trust that you're accomplishing good through evil. We thank you that our classes was able to meet together for the first time this year, just yesterday. We thank you that we can learn from one another Encourage one another in the mission that you've given us as churches of the Lord Jesus Christ. We trust that you gave us wisdom in the decisions that we made for the good of your church and for your glory, fame and honour in this world. We dedicate our gifts to you now, the offerings that we have brought through this week. We pray that you would help us to trust you week by week as we give a portion of what we've received from your hand to further the mission of your church, and to express our love and gratitude for all that you've done for us. Would you also please open your word to us now? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
our next reading from Ezra, we read about how the foundation of the temple was laid. And yet the people both rejoiced and wept. The older ones wept because the glory of the new temple was nothing like the glory of the old temple. Then they gave money to the masons and carpenters and gave food and drink and olive oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre so that they would bring cedar logs by sea from Lebanon to Joppa as authorized by Cyrus, king of Persia. In the second month of the second year after their arrival at the house of God in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Josedach, and the rest of the people, the priests and the Levites, and all who had returned from the captivity to Jerusalem, began the work. They appointed Levites twenty years old and older to supervise the building of the house of the Lord. Joshua and his sons and brothers, and Cadmiel and his sons, descendants of Hodavia, and the sons of Henadad and their sons and brothers, all Levites, joined together in supervising those working on the house of God. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving they sang to the Lord, He is good, his love toward Israel and you is forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads, who had seen the former temple, wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping, because the people made so much noise, and the sound was heard far away. Now we come to our text in Haggai chapter 1. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josedak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, The time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your panelled houses, while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages, only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house, so that I may take pleasure in it and be honoured, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home I blew away. Why? declares the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil and everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock, and on all the labour of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the twenty-fourth day of the sixth month. This is the word of the Lord. Who 
Have you ever seen a large building where the person who started building it stopped before it got finished? I was just remembering a story from my early teenage years to my own children uh, earlier this week. I had a friend whose father taught for a couple of years in Tonga as a high school teacher on a teaching exchange and I had the opportunity to go on holiday there for a couple of weeks and one day my friend and I we were uh, walking through the coconut trees and we stumbled across a hotel although it wasn't a hotel as you you or I would recognize one a foundation had been laid we had the concrete slab floors for four stories up there was even a concrete stairway so you could get from the bottom all the way up to the top but no walls no internal walls no no windows no no nothing no hotel it was a great place to fly remote control planes from uh, up on the top deck but this builder started building this hotel and then they ran out of money and it was utterly useless I don't know if there's a good news story here or not because I, I went to Google Maps this week to try to find this hotel that I remembered from my teenage years and I couldn't find it anywhere. So either that means, good news story, it eventually was finished and so I couldn't find the ruins on Google Maps or bad news story, it means it was eventually demolished. Either way, someone started building something and didn't get it finished. We're going to be talking today and thinking about another story of a building which was started but left unfinished for a good number of years. And that building was the temple of God in the land of Israel, in the city of Jerusalem, the place where God was worshipped. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had destroyed the temple after stripping it bare of all its valuables. Uh, the remnant of the people who were, who were left uh, survived and spent some 60 to 70 years uh, in exile in a foreign land. But now there's a change. Change is in the air. There's a new leader of the free world. Persia is now the top dog on the block. And in the first year of her new uh, king, her new king, her new leader, Cyrus, and in order that the word of the Lord might be fulfilled, Cyrus declared that anyone who wanted to from Israel could go back to their home country, back to Jerusalem, and rebuild the temple of God. As we read earlier from Ezra chapter 3, the, the people built an altar to the Lord on, on, on the foundation site where this ruined temple was. And they gave generously to the work of rebuilding. And a foundation, a new foundation was laid for a new temple. And then the problems began. Then the surrounding peoples began to object. They raised legal objections and threatened the people of Israel with a bash if they didn't, if they didn't stop rebuilding their temple. And so for about 15 years, all progress on the new temple completely stalled, came to an utter standstill. And then our friend Haggai arrives on the scene. But before I go any further, I've got an important question to ask you. That's one you might have been thinking of already. You see, it's all very well to be considering a book in the Bible which talks about building temples. But how does that relate to us? There's no longer a temple in Jerusalem. And surely we mustn't pretend that we're still living in Haggai's day. But how do we get from Haggai's day to us today in the 21st century? Well, friends, we get to today from the Old Testament, as we do in almost everything, through Jesus and through the cross. You see, the temple in the Old Testament wasn't just a building. It represented something so much more. It was the symbol of God's presence. It was the symbol of the place where forgiveness could be found, cleansing could be obtained, where blessing could be, could, could be found. You know, all of those things are no longer found in a physical building. I mean, we're thankful for our church buildings, even if ours is unoccupied and fairly underutilized right now. We're thankful for, for buildings because they provide a convenient place for us to meet and encourage to one another, but they're not essential. Uh, these things that the temple in the Old Testament pointed ahead to are no longer found in a building. They're found in Jesus. You see, the temple was only ever like the first chapter in the story. 
Something pointing ahead to something greater that was still to come. Jesus. Jesus, our great high priest, in whom we see the presence of God dwelling amongst us, through whom we have access to the Father, the forgiveness of sins, cleansing and great blessing. Jesus Christ is the new temple of God. Jesus is all that the temple looked ahead to and more. But there's one there's still one more step that we can take. You see, the New Testament goes on to describe how the new temple is the body of Jesus Christ. Not just Jesus' physical body. You remember Jesus said to the Pharisees, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days, speaking of his own body. But his body in being his people. Like we've been looking at in 1 Corinthians, the body of Christ. We read in 1 Peter chapter 2 that another temple is being built. It's a spiritual house, a spiritual temple. Peter says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And that's us. That's us. That's the church, the church of Jesus Christ. So when it comes to temple building today, we have a similar yet different task than the folk did in Haggai's day. We have the task of building the house of God, that is his church, his kingdom of building for God's glory. And as we set about that task, We're called, like the people in Haggai's day were called, firstly, to recognize God's priority. Haggai begins to stir the people up by exposing the self-centered priorities that had begun to creep into their lives. They had neglected to recognize the priority of God, his priority above all other priorities, And therefore, they had abandoned the work that had set them. Firstly, do you see, the Lord lays their excuses out in the open and on the table. This is what the people have been saying. The time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. I think you've got to say, that's a pretty clever excuse to have given. You see, they're not denying the importance of building the temple... They're not saying it shouldn't be built. and They're not saying that they won't be involved in the building of it either. They're not denying their responsibilities. They're just saying, well, look, we're just a little concerned about the timing. Uh, Not yet, Lord. The time's not yet right. And certainly the time and circumstances might very well not have seemed the best to them. They'd been forbidden to build after these legal objections had been raised from the... From, this, from the fierce objections of the surrounding peoples who didn't want to see a temple built and didn't want to see Jerusalem rebuilt from its ruins. They'd been experiencing difficult news on the economic front. There'd been a severe drought that had ripped the heart out of the economy. They might have well have been arguing, as you or I might have, might have argued, they might have been arguing that, that, look, God's shutting doors instead of opening them. And so when we, when we stop... We're actually just following the Lord's guidance. He's closed doors. Let's wait for them to open. But you know, their excuses didn't impress God. You see, when we work for the Lord, we're not to wait until all the difficult circumstances around us have gone away before we start seeking to serve God in our world and to build his church. After all, many of the difficult circumstances we face... They don't just happen, not here by by random chance. They're they're the consequences of our having a spiritual enemy who's opposed to us, who doesn't want to make life easy for us. He's not cooperating. And so to argue that that we should wait until all of the difficult circumstances around us have gone, that's just not realistic. That's just an excuse like it was for the people back then. An excuse of a disobedience. 
Well, we like to offer excuses, don't we? And we're fairly good at it. Look, I'm just in the process of, of getting settled down in my life, and when things are under control, I'll, I'll get busy. Look, let me just let me just wait a few years until I, I've got the mortgage under control or, or, or fully repaid, and, and then I'll be able to give to the Lord's work. Oh, look, it doesn't really seem the right time to speak to my friend about the gospel. I'll, I'll wait for a better opportunity. I'm just a little busy in my life right now to, to volunteer, to, to contribute. I just don't have the time. And you think, I think what all of those excuses have in common is they don't give credence to the Lord's priority in our lives. They fail to recognize God's priority, that God calls us to, to make him our first priority in life, not, not the priority that we get to when, when everything else has been taken care of. God calls us not to play off, off ourselves or our own interests or our families against the interests of God himself. I want you to notice how the Lord exposes everyone's excuses, because he really does. Is it time for you yourselves to be living in your panelled houses while this house remains a ruin? <laughs> you see, the people have pleaded poverty, haven't they? They said, look, we don't have the money. Uh, the circumstances, the timing isn't right. But do you notice something? It hadn't stopped them from building their own houses while the Lord's house lay in ruins. And not only had they built their own houses after having returned from exile, they had adorned them with luxury. That's what's indicated by, by the text when, when it talks about how they'd built panelled houses. That's the finishing touches of excellence. And so they've, they've finished the exterior landscaping. They've got the paved barbecue area. They've got, they've got the indoor spa sauna. They've got, they've got the latest OLED TV with, with Dolby Atmos surround sound in the living room for, for a great home cinema experience. And every time they looked out their panoramic windows, they tried to ignore the harsh reality of a ruined temple which lay below them. Oh, it's not time! It's not time for, for the Lord's house to be rebuilt, they said. But in the same time, in the same breath, they said, it's high time for us to live in luxury. You know, the truth of the matter was they were feathering their own nests while the Lord's work suffered neglect in their lives. You know, friends, since our goal is to glorify God, to glorify God, to make much of God, to make his magnificence known throughout the world, to build for his glory and not for our own. We could ask ourselves some questions this morning. Does the way that I use my time, does that indicate that, that God is my priority? Does the, way I, I, I sh does the way I spend my money indicate that God's kingdom is of greater importance to me than, than the values of those who are living around me and trying to teach me how I, ought, how I ought to use my money instead. Do I ever think, look, is there something I should sacrifice in my life for the sake of the kingdom, for, for the sake of mission, for the sake of ministries of mercy? Jesus said, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. My friend, are your priorities in the right place? But as well as recognizing God's priority, we also need to understand God's providence. Have I now asked the people to think about what's happening in their lives? while they're at the same time neglecting God. And this is what had happened. They had sown much, but brought in little. They had a succession of failed harvests. They ate, but didn't have enough. They were not able to satisfy their hunger. They drank, but they were not filled with their drink. They weren't even able to drown their sorrows. They clothed themselves, but no one was warm. They couldn't keep out that 
chill of winter that we've been experiencing over the last few weeks here in Toowoomba. They earned wages only to put them in a bag with holes. What that means is their income failed, their rising incomes even, failed to meet their expenses. You know, time of inflation and time of famine, the income they had couldn't meet their rising cost of living. And why had these things happened? Well, we see the surprising answer in verses 9 through 11, if you have your Bibles open. See, it wasn't simply bad luck. It wasn't just that they had a a run of things going a, a bad way. It wasn't. No, God had intervened. God had brought these difficult circumstances upon them. Why would God do that? Would God do that? Verse 9. Because of my house, which remains a ruin. You see, God is saying there was a direct connection between putting off God's work and their troubling economic situation. The people of Israel had used their economic misfortunes to come up with excuses not to build. A poor harvests have, have taxed our resources. We just don't have the, the we just don't have enough. They said God's providence teaches us. Look, the time isn't right. That there will be a time, but but not now. But we're, we're taken behind the scenes here, aren't we? And we're shown here that the direct hand of God was at work rebuking them for their misplaced priorities. They had misread God's providence. They thought bad circumstances was an excuse for disobedience rather than seeing their their difficult circumstances as the direct result of their disobedience. I think there's a challenge for us in this, isn't there? Isn't there a challenge in in the way we think of God at work and, and active in our world today? You see, even unintentionally, we can come to think of God as sort of like Father Christmas, Santa Claus in the sky, who, who gives out good things when we ask. He's, he's always there to supply our every need. And we forget that God's providence can cut both ways. That God can also bring difficult circumstances into our lives as well. Perhaps, perhaps, because of our disobedience. We're told here to consider our ways, to examine our situation, to pay close attention to our present circumstances. So let's do that. How does God's providence look to you right at this very moment? Is he blessing you? Are you you prospering? Is life going well for you? Or it could be, on the other hand, that you're suffering misfortune as God's people did back here in Haggai's day. Maybe the Lord has taken away the satisfaction that you used to have and the things that he's given you. I raise the question today, a very important question, not because it's just like a simple dot-to-dot puzzle where we can connect all the lines and, and, and boom, 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 A, B, C, look, bad things are happening, therefore... I must be in in disobedience of God. Now, the Bible is more complex than that. Just look at the book of Job, for example. The book of Job is is here in the Bible as an example to us that bad stuff can happen, terrible stuff can happen to people who serve God admirably, faithfully. But it is a possibility, a possibility that if things are going bad for you in your life, The reason is your own disobedience. Your neglect of the Lord's work, his church and his kingdom, misplaced priorities in your life. We mustn't expect or anticipate God to bless us if we neglect his body and neglect the mission that he's given us to build the church, to build for his glory. Friends, we need to recognize God's priority. We need to rightly understand God's providence, his arranging of the circumstances of our lives. Then there's one final thing that we're called to, and that is to obey 
God's command. And the command, the command is what we've been dwelling on, to build the temple. No longer for us a physical building as it was in Haggai's day. No, no longer a building of wood and stone, but a building of living flesh and bones and blood. A, a building of people to build the church of God, to encourage her, to build her up, to strengthen her, to labor for the kingdom of God to flourish in our world. Why? Look at the goal in verse 8. Build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honoured, says the Lord. And you know what? This story does have a good ending. This story has a good ending because the people responded to God's word. The people listened, they heard and they obeyed. When they heard the word of the Lord through, through the voice of his messenger, they didn't argue. They didn't come up with excuses any longer. They didn't dispute the timing. No, verse 12, they obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. They responded promptly. They acted swiftly. They heard the message and they resolved to obey. They also responded, end of verse 12, by fearing the Lord. Instead of shrinking from the task that God had given them in the light of a fear of others, a fear of the surrounding nations, instead they feared the Lord. To fear the Lord is to love him and to Obey him with a wholehearted devotion, to have a holy awe and respect for him. All true obedience arises out of a right knowledge, understanding, love, and fear of the Lord. And so Haggai is doing nothing more, nothing less than picturing true religion for us here. Fearing the Lord and obeying the message of his word. And God encourages them, doesn't he? Look at verse 13. I am with you, declares the Lord. What a relief those words must have been. Just put yourself in their shoes for a moment. For 15 years, they have been disobeying God and neglecting the task that he's given them. They might, well have, they might well have wondered, how's God going to react? How's God, God going to respond to our inactivity for so long? They may well have been somewhat apprehensive. What will God do? How's he going to react? He says, I am with you. He encourages them. And for us as the church of God, as the new temple of God, we might think similarly to the mission that God has given us, the, the commission that he's given to his church in Matthew 28. The mission to go and disciple the nations, teaching and baptizing, helping people to come to know God and helping people to grow to maturity in Christ. And as we go about that difficult task today, what encouragement do we have? Well, isn't it the same encouragement? How does the Great Commission end? And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's Jesus' promise. You know, as a church, if we are to work for the Lord, we need his presence and blessing. Without him, we are weak. We will be totally ineffectual. We'd be on our own. It'd be a hopeless task. Without God, we can do nothing. But friends, with God and with God's presence, all things are possible. We're called today to take a fresh look at our lives. To reorder our priorities, if that's necessary. 
the use of our money and time and, and gifts and resources, our purpose and direction and the goal of our lives. To give ourselves over to that task, to, to work in such a way as we seek to build up the church of God, the kingdom of God here in Toowoomba, throughout Australia, throughout the world, as we have opportunity to work in such a way that God would be honoured and glorified in it. We do so in confidence. I am with you. Amen. Let's seek God's help in prayer. Would you join me as we pray? Our Father in heaven, how we need your help in this difficult task that you've given us. And Father, we confess this morning that it is so easy for us to get off direction, that instead of seeking your glory and the good of your people in this world, instead of that being the bullseye target of our lives, we find ourselves so easily chasing after the things of this world and following the example of those around us who don't know you. Please forgive us for this, Lord. Please forgive us. Reorient our lives to Christ through the gospel. Help us to see the preciousness of all that you have done for us and to make it the joy and delight of our lives to see others enriched, blessed, strengthened, and prepared for a life, an eternity with you forever. Forgive us, we pray. Help us to give careful consideration to our lives. Help us to reflect on what we're doing and why and, and what for, that we might dedicate all that we have to you and to your glory, that you might be honoured and glorified in it. Heavenly Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to sing as our closing song this morning, We Declare. We declare as the body of Christ the praises of God. We are his kingdom. We are his, his bride. For us, he paid the price for us. Jesus died. God put such a great price, such value, such glory upon his people, upon, upon his body, the church. We sing as the church of our thankfulness to God. Would you join me as we sing?
It's been good to be able to worship together today. I want to extend an invitation to you, as I did last week, to join us later this afternoon, later today, from about quarter to five onwards on Zoom. We're going to be running an afternoon study as we reflect on Calvinism and the Christian life. I'd love for you to join us. We're starting at about quarter to five so that we can have a chance for five, ten, fifteen minutes just to talk with one another, share what's been happening in our weeks before we get underway. It'd be great if you could join us. You can find the Zoom meeting ID and password in the church news. Or you can uh, email me, you can text me, you can message our Facebook page, and I can give those to you if you're further afield and would like to join us. For now, as you go out into this week, seeking to build the kingdom of God, seeking to be used by God, seeking to prioritize God in what you do, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord turn his face toward you and grant you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. It's been great having you with us. If I don't see you before next Sunday, see you then.